All right, our next speaker is representing the year 2019. And he's also spoke at 15, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23. And I always put him toward the very end to make sure people stick around because he's awesome, right? You thought I was going to insult him, but no, that was awesome because he's, he's an awesome guy. Um, and he's been held at gunpoint twice. But he's never been as scared as when he was teaching his son to drive. Please, everyone, a really big welcome for Max. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So uh, maybe for the first time here, I am not talking about modeling. It's a new experience for me, um, hopefully for you too. I'm going to talk about Shiny Live. Uh, has anybody ever heard of that yet? OK, good. All right. Good. Excellent. So to, before that, I want to talk about Cordo. Um, I didn't think I'd have to introduce this, but I did actually meet a few people this week who had never heard of it. Cordo is sort of like the next generation of like the R Markdown family of stuff, like Blogdown and all the other downs. Um, it's independent of R, so it's like a, a it's its own um, application you install. You can use it with Python or Julia or Bash or whatever you want to use. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about using Shiny inside of Cordo. Um, I, my main application is for books, but you can use it for like these slides in particular, um, or other things, or blogs or whatnot. We we're kind of looking into if Hadley's out there. I hope we're looking into using it for our package down sites, which would be a nice change. And then Shiny. And I'm pretty sure everybody here has heard of Shiny and probably telling you things you already know. But historically, if you want to deploy a Shiny app, like have somebody interact with it who's not on your computer or not you or whatnot, you basically had to use a server. So you could get your own Shiny license or you know, download Shiny and build your own server and, and manage all that yourself. Or you could use one of the hosted services, um, posit has shinyapps.io and posit connect. Um, but just to tell you what you probably already know is if you have a Shiny app, all that, the, the software and everything sits on the server. Um, maybe data is already there. Maybe you upload data or whatnot. Um, and then your, your, your uh, TV, your phone, your computer, it's just a terminal that you interact with it. It sends messages to Shiny, the, the server. The server does calculations and brings it back. And you know, that's pretty traditional. Um, just as an example app, this is something where, has anybody ever heard of UMAP? It's, like a, it's supposed to be like a souped up PCA. Um, it, it makes really cool looking pictures. Um, it's not very great for modeling. Um, but you know, in, in talking about it and describing it, I wanted to have something that could show like, hey, it's not really stable. Like if you initialize it in a bunch of different ways or change some of the parameters a little bit, like you can get very different Results and so for me in my application, I, I want to build books in HTML that has like a lot of things like this that you can interact with them instead of it being like, let me tell you about what happened in the static figure. And so that's sort of like my application of, of using Shiny with Cordo at least. So along came WebR. So WebR is like just something. It, I, it just seems like magic to me. It probably is um, something called WebAssembly was built a while ago, and, and Python was eventually built inside of WebAssembly, and now we have it with R. So what you do is uh, what WebAssembly does is basically um, uh, builds R into a, a binary format that you can then access in JavaScript and so on. So it's not like you're rebuilding R to the application that's on your computer. You're building it to be used on the web and in the browser. That's the point. So um, basically, JavaScript is your interface there. If you want more information, um, pause it about a year or so ago. I um, hired a guy named George Stagg, who was doing a lot of work on this on his own. And then we hired him and brought him in to develop WebR more um, extensively and to basically fund that. Um, and this link to this video is really, really good if you want to learn more about WebAssembly. Um, George manages a repository. It's not CRAN, but like a pos repository where he's taking um, all the CRAN um, packages in with WebAssembly, building a binary version of those so that you can use it with WebR. And if you look at the statistics there, there's like two interesting sort of differentiations. Is uh, as of like today, um, there's about 19,000 packages built with uh, WebAssembly, which is about 94% of CRAN. Um, but that 6% that's missing are things that other packages depend on. So that's the number of packages built. But the packages you can actually use are somewhat lower than that, because if you depend on any of those 6% that are left out, you can't really load the package. So he's just slowly whittling away at all the sort of crazy things, as you can imagine, that happen inside of our packages. 
but it's it's fairly complete at this point, I feel. Um, I've yet to, to try to list something or try to use something that's not really available, so it might sort of be in the, the tail of things that are used. So just to give you a sense of how WebR works, this is a like a, the most simple example I had is you know you, you get a terminal, you execute it, and this is all running inside my browser. So just to be clear, there's a version of R that's been packaged up with any packages that you need, and that is embedded into the website that my browser is serving. Okay, um, so it's all local, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, if you want another package, let's say uh, Deployer, you can. Do that, and of course the font's too big here, but you can see it got it and loaded it pretty oops, pretty quickly. Ooh, hold on, come back. Um, so it's, it's quite amazing. Um, so that's WebR, and then came along Shiny Live. So Shiny Live is like sort of a version of WebR that's built to serve Shiny locally, so no server required. The server's kind of like built into your browser at this point. And so what it does is all the computations run locally, so when I start up this particular, this is built with Shiny Live, um, this, the slides. So when I start up the slides with uh, Cordo, um, it, it loads R, it loads the packages that I declare that I'll need, and then it also builds a Shiny server inside that I could just use it without sending any messages back and forth to an external server. It does almost all the heavy lifting for you, um, and we'll see the almost in just a second. So just to clarify, it might kind of seem obvious at this point, Shiny Server, all the things happen on a server. You're just sending messages back and forth, and it's serving you images and, and whatever it is that you're looking for um, in your output. Shiny Live downloads R and packages, runs everything locally. Okay. Now, if you want to get set up uh, with Cordo, the first thing you have to do is go to a terminal inside of your Cordo project and run this command. And it essentially, Cordo has a bunch of extensions you can use for various things. Like if you want to use like Font Awesome, there's an extension for that and so on. What the Shiny Live extension does is gives you all the infrastructure to run Shiny in the way that we're going to do. And then one more thing is the way Cordo runs is um, everything's done in Markdown. So when you like, um, when you process your files, you get a markdown file at the end of that, and then we use uh, Pandoc to basically convert it to HTML or tech or whatever it is that you're going to like render it in, like your target um, output format. And so what you have to do is you have to sort of shim that process. And so a, a quarter filter um, is something that will basically not interrupt, but sort of get in the inside of that process of making the markdown, converting it to Pandoc, and then compiling it into the final format. And so you just have somewhere in your uh, Cordo YAML file, you have to have a, a filters argument and just tell it to treat Shiny Live a little bit more differently. And after that, you're done. You can start writing code chunks. So in code chunks in R, at least if you're used to like Knitter and R Markdown, you would just use like bracket R bracket, and that's telling it that you know I have an R chunk. And instead of doing that, you use Shiny Live dash R. And I should also say. Um, that everything I'm telling you about R is also true about Python. So we have Shiny for Python, we have Shiny Live. Python was the original sort of like first version of that, and so on. Of course, Quarter works with Python. So if you're more of a Python person, all this will also be true for you, except for it would be Python and not R here. Um, one other thing you have to do is you have to declare this one option called standalone and set it to true, which makes it work inside of Quarto, and then just put your Shiny app in. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. Like if you're used to writing Shiny and you just do the setup, then now you have Shiny locally, which is kind of amazing. Um, how do you declare packages? So you're going to use various packages. Like in that, that UMAP example, I have like ggplot, like a, one of the color palette packages, as well as dplyr loading in there. And so uh, Shiny Live and WebR need to know what you need so it can go out and get them. And so the way you would do that is um, it uses rend, if you've ever used that. So you just say like library dplyr, and it knows to go out and get it. Now there might be, we do this in tiny models a lot, um, you might have packages you want there, but you're not going to directly look, attach them. You want to call them by namespace, or you know it's an imported package for you. And so what you can do in that case is you can just declare it as a library, like you normally would, just comment at that out, and then rend will pick that up. Um, so right now what it does is when you build, when you render your, your Shiny app, um, it goes out, it downloads R, and then it goes to the, the Wasm uh, code repository and gets the current version of that package. 
and that's what you use. But we think a lot about reproducibility, so we're, we're continually, or George, the we here is George, um, we're continually working on making that happen more. So the, there's, I don't think it's been committed yet, but he was telling me what they're going to do is at the time that you build the app, not the render time, but the build time, that they'll go out to the WASM repository, get the versions that are like the most recent versions then, when you built it, and then sort of like either cache them or, um, or he'll just keep, keep he'll uh, retain all the old versions, all the binary versions of these packages. So you can get, probably get the package version that you started with originally or something that's pretty close to it. And I, I imagine this is going to get more sophisticated as time goes on because there's a lot we could probably do with RM to get around this, like a, like a lock file or snapshot, um, but we're not quite there yet. All right, so how do you get your code in? Like, if you're not just going to, if you have like a long, shiny app, you just don't want to paste that into some Cordo doc, um, probably. And how do you get data in? Like, you might want to upload a CSV file or let the users do that and analyze it. And this is where it gets like the almost. This is where it gets interesting. And there's really one simple, simple principle that you have to remember, which is this. Um, is you're in JavaScript, or actually, you're in WebAssembly's world now. Um, but, you know, that you're sort of constrained a little bit. So getting data in is a little bit more difficult. Because if you've used Cordo, at least when I started using this, I was like, well, if I have a code chunk that makes some um, data frame or some model object, and I go to do the next code chunk, I have that just laying around to so just go ahead and use that, right? It doesn't work like that. It's basically spawning another R process inside the browser that is basically clean. So that's why we list the packages. We just don't in, um, inherit the ones we've already loaded or attached. So you have to do a little bit extra or a little bit differently um, uh, techniques to load data or source files and things like that. So Web, WebAssembly doesn't really let you just like open a network connection. Um, so you can see if you want to learn more, because I don't understand this part, um, you can go to the, the GitHub issue around this. But curl is definitely a no-no. So if you've been using curl, uh, that's not going to be allowed. And what George has done is he's patched download.file in base R, so it will use basically a separate protocol to get the files. And that works pretty well. Uh, for me, it's a little like more simple than maybe what you're going to deal with because I keep all my stuff on GitHub in a public uh, repo. So you'll see how I do it in a minute. But um, but this is the only thing that might trip you up a little bit in terms of like, well, how do I get my data in in a way that Shiny Live and uh, WebAssembly will permit? And again, if you want to read more, there's an issue here that you could upvote or get feedback on. Now, Gordon Shotwell, who's in the Shining Group, like succinctly put. He was like, I'm terrified of this in a way, um, because we're going to have people that are going to um, you know, not realize that anything, data or code, that's in their Shiny app is available locally to whoever has the URL, right? Yeah. Somebody was like, <sighs> um, And so any data you have goes to the client. Any code you have goes to the client. If you accidentally maybe have an object that has some API key that you need for the app, it's available to the client. So you have to be like super careful about what you put in the app, even if it's like you're giving somebody access to upload CV, uh, CSV files to analyze or something like that, or let them connect to a database. You just have to be cognizant that anything that gets in there uh, theoretically could be used by somebody else or accessed by somebody else. So here's sort of the example pattern that I have here is I have like a figure chunk, um, single equal true. And then you know I'll start with some library calls. So it, it, I could say it's a tiny model stock now, um, not really. Um, and then what I'll do is like I have like for that for that UMAP example, I've just pre-computed all the configurations I'm going to use in uh, in Shiny. So I just have a, our data file out there on GitHub, and then I can basically use the GitHub raw um, URL structure here. It's the same structure. It just has a different root uh, of the URL to load the data. And then I like my Shiny stuff to be a little bit more modular, because the book has a certain styling that you do beforehand, and I don't want to replicate that. So you can just like down or source um, specific R files uh, that are somewhere that's accessible. And then you just return the app. Um, I'm telling you this in particular, because it may seem obvious, but the two sort of nuances that are true right now, but I'm, I'm guessing what might get better over time, is when RM scans your code to see what packages you need, if those package declarations are in the sourced file, it won't see them. Um, and the other sort of constraint is, for some reason, if you, if you return the app in the R file, it also won't load the app. So you have to explicitly return it here. OK, so that's little nuances that I think, I don't know if they're oversights, but are something we can just make the experience better for. 
Um, just to give you a sense of that UMAP one, um, here's what it looks like. And I have like a setup file that I source and then the actual UMAP app. Um, one nice thing about books is you can do a lot of cross-referencing. So we have a way to like, you know, make the Shiny app an actual like figure in your book, not just something that's sitting there. So, um, so there's a little bit of Cordo work you do here to make it work, but it's, uh, it's pretty simple. So some of you might be wondering, like, why would Plaza do this? Like, why would George do this, right? Because, like, we sell, shiny, we sell shiny servers and pause and things like that. And the answer, you know, and I remember when I first met him, not long after he was hired, we were talking about this. And, like, Hadley might be like, sure, I don't know if I'm saying something I shouldn't. But, like, I was like, so why are we doing it? I mean, I, I want to do this, but, like, why are we doing it? And at the time, I think George said that, you know, I think maybe we talked to some people in our company. They were like, well, look, we know somebody's going to do this, right? We, we, can't, we wouldn't try to stop it, but what we should do is we should bring it in and make sure that we fund it and support it and nurture it in a way that we can so that when we go to use WebR or WebAssembly, we get the best possible experience. So George is in Posit. He does, if you ever have a chance to meet him, the guy's crazy amazing. Uh, he's just incredible technically. Um, but I don't know that we're terribly worried about Shiny Live because it's really not the answer to a lot of things that you might want to do. So, you know, it, you could be running this on your TV, right? Your computing power is not that great. You have to basically assume like a lowest common denominator in terms of what resources people have to, to run the Shiny app. Um, I've already mentioned uh, about code and data security, and so that might be sort of a no-no for what you're doing. And also just moving data around might be expensive. So, you know, my, you know, I'm loading for the book, I'm loading like, I don't know, 80, 70, 80 megabyte R data files at most. And that takes maybe like a second or two um, to do, depending on your web connection. And I should also say, I'll do that at the end here. Um, it's really faster than I thought it would be as you're downloading R and packages in, in R data. But if you're like, hey, let's do deep learning in Shiny Live, it's like, eh, that's probably not going to be, I don't know what kind of computer you're using, but um, it may not be something that's really realistic. And then, you know, we have Connect for good reason. Like, we'll handle authentication, parameterization reports, like cron jobs and all this stuff. And it's not like you can't do that yourself. In fact, as a company, we've, you know, uh, Tarif has always said that we don't ever want to have anything that we lock you into for money. So we're never going to have a product that you will we'll have a similar version of the product that would make it easier and nicer to use, but you could do it yourself if you wanted to. And that's what makes Connect so wonderful. You can write cron jobs yourself, so you know how to do this. But to have like technical support and all that done for you is one of the reasons I think that Shiny Live for most most commercial people are not going to be canceling their um, their accounts for that. Um, I should also say I meant to do this earlier, going back to the actual app. Let me just reload it. It may not be accurate because there is some caching that it does. But if you think of, I think the R build, the binary is like maybe like six or seven uh, megabytes, and the packages are pretty small, even dplyr. Um, and so um, just loading it, I timed it at about four or five seconds. So yeah. So it's pretty fast. It's remarkably fast, especially compared to what it was in the first version. You know, and, and I joke about dplyr, but you know, there's all these people like, oh, the tidyverse and all their packages, and you have to get like 20 packages. I'm using ggplot and dplyr, and that probably has, I don't know, I'm going to guess like a dozen or so dependencies, and it's loading in seconds with the data, which is about 20 megabytes. So that, that's pretty good in terms of speed. So yeah. Um, that's pretty much the end of it. Um, if you want to learn more, Joe Chang, last year's uh, POSIT conference, gave an excellent, excellent talk about um, Shiny and Wasm. It's definitely worth looking at. Um, you know, me, I'm always, for something that's new especially, I want to see examples of what other people are doing. So this link here will go out and look for all the GitHub projects that have Shiny-Live or Shiny-Python. And then George has some really good applications too. There's a, a great talk that he has. But also, if you want to think of it in terms of like, well, could we use Arrow or like, what would we do? So he has a, a Shiny app on uh, his GitHub uh, repository um, that um, uses DuckDB and Parquet files. So if you want to test that out locally and say like, how, you know, would that work well? You can go out and test it now. So thanks for speaking, especially thanks to Nicole. Like we've called her out a couple times and she's like, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the Cub Scout den mother of the place. She literally like keeps everything running. No offense, Jared, but it's true. <laughs> um, so, you know, big thanks to her and, and uh, Jared and, and all the people, especially who put WebR and Shiny Live together. <laughs>